Part One, Chapter Nine of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Mushrooms on the Moor, by Frank W. Borum. Part One, Chapter Nine, Forty. Life moves along so smoothly with most of us that there seems to be very little difference between one birthday and another. But to this rule there is one brilliant and outstanding exception. There is one birthday on which a man should certainly take a holiday, go for a quiet stroll, and indulge in a little serious stock-taking. That birthday is, of course, the fortieth. A man's fortieth birthday is one of the really great days in his life's little story, and he must make the most of it. I live in a city which boasts a comparatively meagre population. The number of people who reach their fortieth birthday simultaneously must be very small. But in a city of any size, some hundreds of people must daily become forty. And if I dwelt in such a place, I should feel tempted to conduct a service every now and again for men and women who are celebrating their fortieth birthday. People so circumstanced, naturally impressed by the dignity and solemnity of the occasion, would welcome such a service and the preacher would have a chance of sowing the seed in ground that was well prepared, and of the greatest possible promise. The selection of a text would present no difficulty. I can think of two right off, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, and there must be scores of others equally appropriate. At forty, a man enters upon middle life. What could be more helpful to him, then, than a short inspiring word on such a text as Habakkuk's prayer, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make thyself known. I have been recalling this morning some painful memories. In my time I have several times known that peculiarly acute species of anguish that only comes to us when we discover a cherished idol in ruins. Men, some of them ministers, upon whose integrity I would cheerfully have staked everything I possessed, suddenly whelmed themselves in shame and staggered out into the dark. It is an experience that makes a man feel that the very earth is rocking beneath him. It makes him wonder if it is possible for a good man to be somehow caught in a hot gust of devilry and swept clean off his feet. But the thing that has impressed me, as I have counted such names sadly on my fingers, is that, without an exception, they were all in the forties, most of them in the early forties. Youth, of course, often sins, and sins grievously. But youth recovers itself, and frequently emerges chastened and ennobled by the bitter experience. But I can recall no instance of a man who fell in the forties, and who ever really recovered himself. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I remember that, some time ago, Sir W. Robertson Nicoll quoted a brilliant essayist as saying that the most dangerous years are the forties, the years when men begin to be rich, when they have opportunities of gratifying their passions, when they perhaps imagine that they have led a starved and meagre existence. And so, as I let my mind play about these old and saddening memories, and as I reflect upon the essayist's corroboration of my own conclusion, I fancy I could utter from the very heart of me a particularly timely and particularly searching word to those who had just attained their fortieth birthdays. Or, if I felt that the occasion was too solemn for speech, I could at least lead them in prayer. And when I led them in prayer, it would certainly be Habakkuk's prayer. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make thyself known. It is a prayer for revival and for revelation. The real significance of that prayer lies in the fact that the supreme tendency of middle life is towards prosiness. Young people write poetry and get sentimental. So do old people. But people in the forties? Never. A man of forty would as soon be suspected of picking his neighbor's pocket as of writing poetry. He would rather be seen walking down the street without collar or necktie than be seen shedding tears. Ask a company of young people to select some of their favorite hymns or songs. They will at once call for hymns about heaven, or songs about love. So will old people. But you will never persuade middle-aged people to sing such songs. They are in the practical or prosy stage of life. The romance of youth has worn off. The romance of age has not arrived. They are between the poetry of the dawn and the poetry of the twilight. And midway between the poetry of the dawn and the poetry of the twilight comes the panting perspiration of noonday. 
when therefore I find myself face to face with my congregation of people who are in the very act of celebrating their fortieth birthday, I shall urge them to pray with the old prophet, that in the midst of the years the youthful romance of their first faith may be revived within them, and that in the midst of the years the revelations that come at eventide may be delightfully anticipated. I said just now, however, that I had an alternative text from the New Testament. I have an idea that if my first service is a success, I shall hold another, and for the sake of variety, I shall address myself to this second theme. Concerning the very first apostolic miracle, we are expressly and significantly told that the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Now I cannot imagine why that particular is added, unless it is to tell those of us who are now above forty years old that we are not beyond the reach of the sensational. We have not outlived the romance of the miraculous. We are not too old at forty to experience all the marvel and wonder of the grace divine. And even as I write, I confidently anticipate the sparkle that will light up the eyes of these forty-year-olds as I remind them that that man was above forty years of age upon whom this first triumph of the church was wrought. But there are worse things than prosiness. The mere change from the poetry of youth to the prose of middle life need not in itself alarm us. Some of the finest classics in our literature are penned in prose. But within this minor peril lies the germ of a major peril. The trouble is that prosiness may develop into pessimism. And when prosiness curdles into pessimism, the case of the patient is very grave. I heard a young fellow in his teens telling a much older man of his implicit faith in the providence of God. Yes, said the senior, with a sardonic smile. I used to talk like that when I was your age. I heard a young girl telling a woman old enough to be her mother of the rapture of her soul's experience. Ah, replied the elder lady, you won't talk like that when you have seen as much of the world as I have. Here, then, at last we have put our finger on the tragedy that threatens us in the forties. Why is it? The reason is not far to seek. The fact is that at forty a man must drop something. He has been all his life accumulating until he has become really overloaded. He has maintained his interest in all the things that occupied his attention in youth, and all the way along the road fresh claims have been made upon him. His position in the world is a much more responsible one, and makes a greater drain upon his thought and energy. He has married, too, and children have come into his home. There has been struggle and sickness and anxiety. Interests have multiplied, and life has increased in seriousness. But increasing in seriousness, it must not be allowed to increase in sordidness. A man's life is like a garden. There is a limit to the things that it will grow. You cannot pack plants in a garden as you pack sardines in a tin. That is why the farmer thins out the turnips. That is why the orchardist prunes his trees. And that is why the husbandman pinches the grape buds off the trailing vines. Life has to be similarly treated. At forty a man realizes that his garden is getting overcrowded. It contains all the flowers that he planted in his sentimental youth, and all the vegetables that he set there in his prosaic manhood. It is too much. There must be a thinning out. And unless he is very, very careful, he will find that the thinning out process will automatically consist of the sacrifice of all the pansies and the retention of all the potatoes. Now, when I address my congregation of people who are celebrating their fortieth birthday, I shall make a most fervent appeal on behalf of the pansies. Potatoes are excellent things, and the garden becomes distinctly wealthier when, in the twenties and thirties, a man begins to moderate his passion for pansies and to plant a few potatoes. But a time comes when he must make a stand on behalf of the pansies, or he will have no soul for anything beyond potatoes. Round his potato beds, let him jealously retain a border of his finest pansies, and depend upon it, when he gets into the fifties and sixties, he will be glad that all through life he remained true to the first fondnesses of youth. Not that he will have to wait for the fifties and the sixties. As soon as a man has faced the situation, taken his stand and made his decision, he begins to congratulate himself upon it. That is one of life's most subtle laws. Let us then see how it operates in another field. Sir Francis June, the great divorce judge, said that the eighth year was the dangerous year in wedded life. More tragedies occurred in the eighth year than in any other. And Mr. Philip Gibbs has recently written a novel entitled The Eighth Year, in which he makes the heroine declare that in marriage the eighth year is the fatal year. It's a psychological fact, said Madge. I work it out this way. 
In the first and second years, a wife is absorbed in the experiment of marriage and in the sentimental phase of love. In the third and fourth years, she begins to study her husband and to find him out. In the fifth and sixth years, having found him out completely, she makes a working compromise with life and tries to make the best of it. In the seventh and eighth years, she begins to find out herself. Life has become prosaic. Her home has become a cage to her. In the eighth year, she must find a way of escape. Anyhow, anywhere. And in the eighth year, the one great question is, in what direction will she go? There are many ways of escape. And so comes the disaster. All this seems to show that the eighth year of marriage is like the fortieth year of life. It is the year in which husband and wife are called upon to make their supreme stand on behalf of the pansies. And supposing they do it? Supposing that they make up their minds that everything shall not be sacrificed to potatoes, what follows? Why, to be sure, the best follows. Coventry Patmore, in his Angel in the House, the classic of all young husbands and young wives, says that the years that follow the eighth are the sweetest and the fullest of all. What, he asks, what, for sweetness like the ten years' wife, whose customary love is not her passion or her play but life, with beauty so maturely fair, affecting mild and manifold, may girlish charms no more compare than apples green with apples gold. Ah, still unpraised Honoria, heaven, when you into my arm it gave, left not hereafter to be given, but grace to feel the good I have. Here, then, is the crisis reached, the stand successfully made on behalf of the pansies, and all life fuller and richer forever afterwards in consequence. Every man and woman at forty is called upon for a similar chivalrous effort. At forty we become the knights of the pansies, and if we let them go we shall find that at fifty it will be difficult to find even a sprig of heartsease anywhere. Whether I take as my text the prophet's prayer for a revival and a revelation in the midst of the years, or the story of the man who was more than forty years old when he fell under the spell of the miraculous, I know how I shall close my sermon. I shall close by telling the story of Dr. Ken and Maggie Tulliver from the mill on the floss. It will convince my hearers that folk in the forties have a great and beautiful and sacred ministry to exercise. Maggie was young, and the perplexities of life were too much for her. Dr. Ken was arrested by the expression of anguish in her beautiful eyes. Dr. Ken was himself neither young nor old, but middle-aged, and Maggie felt a childlike, instinctive relief when she saw that it was Dr. Ken's face that was looking into hers. That plain, middle-aged face, with a grave, penetrating kindness in it, seeming to tell of a human being who had reached a firm, safe strand, but was looking with helpful pity towards the strugglers still tossed by the waves, had an effect on Maggie at this moment which was afterwards remembered by her as if it had been a promise. And then George Eliot makes this trite and significant remark. The middle-aged, she says, who have lived through their strongest emotions, but are yet in the time when memory is still half-passionate and not merely contemplative, should surely be a sort of natural priesthood, whom life has disciplined and consecrated to be the refuge and rescue of early stumblers and victims of self-despair. Most of us, at some moment in our young lives, would have welcomed a priest of that natural order in any sort of canonicals or uncanonicals, but had to scramble upwards into all the difficulties of nineteen, entirely without such aid. And after hearing that fine story, my congregation of folk on the threshold of the forties will return from the quiet church to the busy street, humming the songs that they sang at nineteen, vowing that, come what may, the potatoes shall not elbow out all the pansies, and congratulating themselves that the richest wine in the chalice of life still waits their thirsty lips. End of Part 1, Chapter 9。Part 1, Chapter 10 of Mushrooms on the Moor。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part One, Chapter Ten, A Woman's Reason. Will you go with me? No, indeed. You must go alone. I shall not appear at all. Why, mother? Because. I came across the above passage near the beginning of one of Myrtle Reed's stories, The Master's Violin, and towards the end I found this. Iris, 
I have been miserable ever since I told you I wrote the letters. Why, dear? Because. And then, in quite another book, Maurice Thompson's Sweetheart Manette, I came upon this. Why can't you tell me? asked Roland Hatch. I don't know that I have the right, replied Manette. Why? Because. Now, that word because is very interesting. It is a woman's reason, Miss Reed confides to us. That may or may not be so. I know nothing about that. It is not my business. I only know that it is the oldest reason, and the safest reason, and by far the strongest. Now really, no man can say why. As Miss Reed says in another passage lying midway between the two quoted, we all do things for which we can give no reason. We do them because. No man can say why he prefers coffee to cocoa, or mutton to beef. He likes the one better than the other because. No man can say why he chose his profession. He decided to be a doctor or a carpenter because. No man can say why he fell in love with his wife. It would be an affectation to pretend that she is really incomparably superior to all other women upon the face of the earth. And yet to him she is not only incomparably superior, and incomparably lovelier, and incomparably nobler, but she is absolutely the one and only woman on the planet or off it. No other swims into the field of vision. She is first, and every other woman is nowhere. Why? Because. There is no other reason. The fact is that we get into endless confusion when we sail out into the dark, mysterious seas that lie beyond that because. Nine times out of ten, our conclusions are unassailable. And nine times out of ten, our reasons for reaching those conclusions are absurdly illogical, totally inadequate, or grossly mistaken. Everybody remembers the fable of the bantam cock, who assured the admiring farmyard that the sun rose every morning because of its anxiety to hear him crow. The fact was indisputable. The sun did certainly rise every morning. It was only at the attempt to ascribe a specific reason for its rising that the argument broke down. It is always safer to say that the sun rises every morning because. Ministers, at least, will recall the merriment that Hugh Latimer made of Master Moore. The good man had been appointed to investigate the cause of the Goodwin Sands. He met with small success in his inquiries. At last he came upon an old man who had lived in the district nearly a hundred years. The centenarian knew. The secret sparkled in his eyes. Master Moore approached the prodigy. "'Yes, sir,' the old man answered. "'I know. Tenterden Steeple is the cause of Goodwin Sands. I remember when they built the steeple. Before that we never heard of sands or flats or shallows off this haven. They built the steeple, and then came the sands. Yes, sir.' Tenterden Steeple is the cause of the destruction of Sandwich Harbor. When we wander beyond that wise word because, circumstances seem malicious. They conspire to deceive us. I remember passing a window in London in which a sewing machine was displayed. The machine was working. A large doll sat beside it, its hand on the wheel. The doll's hand appeared to be turning the handle. As a matter of fact, the machine was electrically driven, and the wheel turned the hand of the doll. In the realm of cause and effect, we are frequently the dupes and victims of a very dexterous system of leisure domain. The resultant quantity is invariably clear. The contributing causes are not what they seem. I find myself believing today pretty much what I believed twenty years ago. But I find myself believing the same things for different reasons. As life goes on, a man learns to put more and more confidence in his conclusions, and to become more and more chary of the reasons that led to those conclusions. If a certain course seems to him to be right, he automatically adopts it, and he confidently persists in it, even after the reasons that first dictated it have fallen under suspicion. More than once, in an emergency at sea, says Dr. Grenfell, the hero of Labrador, I have swiftly decided upon a certain line of action. If I had waited to hem my reason into a corner before adopting that course, I should not be here to tell the tale. We often flatter ourselves that we base our conclusions upon our reasons. In reality, we do nothing of the kind. The mind works so rapidly that it tricks us. It is another case of leisure domain. Once more, it is the machine that turns the doll, and not the doll that turns the machine. Our thinking faculties often play at ride a cock horse. We recall Browning's lines, When I see boys ride a cock horse, I find it in my heart to embarrass them, by hinting that their stick's a mock horse, and they really carry what they say carries them. The rugged truth is that first of all we reach our conclusions. That is the starting point. 
Then, amazed at our temerity in doing so, we hastened to tack on a few reasons as a kind of apology to ourselves for our own intrepidity, a tardy concession to intellectual decency and good order. But whether we recognize it or not, we do most things because. As Pascal told us long ago, the heart has reasons which the reason does not know. It is the heart that feels God, not the reason. When old Samuel Wesley lay dying in 1735, he turned to his illustrious son John, saying, The inward witness, son, the inward witness. That is the proof, the strongest proof of Christianity. I did not at the time understand him, says John, in quoting the words with approval long afterwards. But the root of the whole matter lies just there. My reference to Dr. Grenfell reminds me. The good doctor was questioned the other day as to his faith in immortality. I believe in it, he replied, because I believe in it. I am sure of it, because I am sure of it. Precisely. That is the point. We believe because. And then, on our sure faith, we pile up a stupendous avalanche of Christian evidences. Emerson tells us of two American senators who spent a quarter of a century searching for conclusive evidence of the immortality of the soul. And Emerson finishes the story by saying that the impulse which prompted their long search was itself the strongest proof that they could have had. Of course, although they knew it not, they already believed. They believed because. And then, finding their faith naked and feeling ashamed, they set out to beg, borrow, or steal a few rags of reasons with which to deck it. It is the problem of Professor Tufelsdrock and Sartor Resartus over again. It all comes back to Carlyle's everlasting yea. The shame is mock modesty, and the craving is a false one. A woman's reason is the best reason. As the years go by, we become less and less eager for evidence. We are content to believe because. I was lately looking out of my window, Martin Luther wrote from Coburg to a friend, and I saw the stars in the heavens and God's great beautiful arch over my head, but I could not see any pillars on which the great builder had fixed this arch. And yet the heavens fell not, and the great arch stood firmly. There are some who are always feeling for the pillars and longing to touch them, and because they cannot touch them they stand trembling and fearing lest the heavens should fall. If they could only grasp the pillars, then the heavens would stand fast. But how do you know that there is any Christ? You never saw him, said poor Augustine St. Clair, the slave owner, to Uncle Tom, the slave. I feel it in my soul, Masser. Feel him now. Oh, Masser, the blessed Lord Jesus loves you. But how do you know that, Tom? said St. Clair. I feels it in my soul, Masser. Oh, Masser, the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. But, Tom, you know that I have a great deal more knowledge than you. What if I should tell you that I don't believe your Bible? Wouldn't that shake your faith some, Tom? Not a grain, Masser. And St. Clair felt himself born on the tide of Tom's faith and feeling, almost to the gate of heaven. I like to hear you, Tom, and sometime I'll talk more. Uncle Tom's argument was the strongest and most convincing after all. If only all we arguers and debaters and controversialists could come to recognize it. He believed because. And now that I come to think of it, Miss Myrtle Reed is wrong in calling it a woman's reason. It is a divine argument, the oldest and sweetest and strongest of all divine arguments. I said just now that a man loves a woman just because he loves her and he could not in a thousand volumes give an intelligent and convincing explanation of his preference. And, let me say it in a hushed and reverent whisper, God loves in much the same way. Listen, and let me read. The Lord did not set his love upon you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. He loved because he loved. He loved because... I intend, therefore, to proclaim the magnificent verities of the Christian gospel. I shall talk with absolute certainty and with unwavering confidence about the sin of man, the love of God, the cross of Christ. If my message is met with a why or a wherefore, I have only one reply, because. There is nothing else to be said. The preacher lives to tell a wonderful love story, and a love story is never arguable. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, why? Because. End of Part 1, Chapter 10
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 2, Chapter 1. The Handicap. It was a sunny autumn afternoon. The leaves were rustling about my feet, and the first nip of winter was in the air. It was Saturday, and I was out for a stroll. Suddenly a crowd attracted my attention, and, impelled by that curiosity which such a concourse invariably excites, I drew near to see whether it meant a fire or a fight. It was neither. As I approached, I caught sight of young fellows moving in and out among the people, wearing light, many-colored garments, and I guessed that a race was about to be run. As soon as I arrived, the men were called up, arranged in a long line, and preparations made for the start. At a signal, two or three of them sprang out from the line and bounded with an easy stride along the road. A few seconds later, three or four more followed, then others, until at last only one was left, and after a brief period of further waiting, he also left the line and set out in pursuit. It was a handicap. It was a handicap, I was told, and this man had started from scratch. It was to be a long race, and it would be some time before any of the runners could be expected back again. The crowd, therefore, dispersed for the time being, breaking up into knots and groups, each of which strolled off to while away the waiting time as its own taste suggested. I turned into a lane that led up into the bush on the hillside, and, from that sheltered and sunny eminence, watched for the first sign of the returning runners. Sitting there with nothing to do, it flashed upon me that the scene I had just witnessed was a reflection, as in a mirror, of all human experience and endeavor. Most men are heavily handicapped. It is no good blinking the fact. Ask a man to undertake some office or assume some responsibility in connection with the church, and he will silence you at once with a narration of the difficulties that stand in his way. Ask a man to act on some board or committee for the management of some charitable or philanthropic enterprise, and he will explain to you that he has not a minute to spare. Ask a man to subscribe to some most necessary or deserving object, and he will tell you of the incessant demands to which he is subjected. Now it is no good putting all this down to can't. We have no right to assume that these are merely the lame excuses of men who, in their secret souls, do not desire to assist us. We must not hastily hurl at them the curse that fell upon Morose because it came not to the help of the Lord against the mighty. All that they say is perfectly true. The difficulties that debar the first of these men from undertaking the work to which you are calling him are both real and formidable. The second man has every moment of his time fully occupied. The third man, because he is known to be generous, is badgered to death with collecting lists from the first thing in the morning till the last thing at night. We must not judge these men too harshly. In the uncharitableness of our hearts, we imagine that they have given us excuses which are not reasons. The fact is, they have done exactly the reverse. They have given us reasons which are not excuses. We are on safer ground when we recognize, frankly, that it is very difficult for many men to devote much time, much energy, and much money to the kingdom of God. Many men are heavily handicapped. 2. Isn't that one of the runners just coming in sight now? A friend asked, pointing along the road. I fancied that he was right, so we rose and strolled down to the spot from which the race had started. We must have been mistaken, for when we emerged from the lane there was no sign of the competitors. I was not sorry, however, that we had returned prematurely, for I noticed the handicapper strolling idly about and got into conversation with him. There seems to me to be very little sense in a race of this kind, I suggested to him. If those men win who started first, the honor is very small in view of the start they received, whilst if the man who started last fails to win, he feels it to be no disgrace and comforts himself with the reflection that he was too heavily handicapped. Is that not so? Oh, no, replied the handicapper, politely concealing his pity for my simplicity. It works out just the other way. It isn't fair, don't you see, to keep those chaps that got away first always running in a class by themselves. It does not call out the best that is in them. But today it does them good to feel that they are being matched against some of the finest runners in the state, and they will strain every effort to try to beat the champions. And it does a man like Brown, who started from scratch, no harm to see those fellows all getting ahead of him at the start. He knows very well that he can beat any man in the country on level terms, and in such races he will only put forth just as much effort as is needed to get ahead of his opponent. But there is nothing to show that he could not do much better still if only his opponent were more formidable. In a race like this, however, he knows that anything may happen. His usual rivals have all got a start of him. If he is to defend his good name, he must beat all his previous records and bring his utmost power into play. And so every man in the race is put on his medal. We consider the handicap a very useful race indeed. Perhaps so, I said, feeling that I was beaten, but feebly attempting to recover my retreat. But how do you compute the exact starts and handicaps which the different men are to take? Ah, he said, now you've touched the vital question. 
I was gratified at his recognition of the good order of my retirement. "'You see,' he went on, "'we have to look at the men's previous performances "'and work out the differences in their records with mathematical exactness. "'But there is something more than that. "'We have to know the men. "'You can't adjust the handicaps by rule of three. "'Anyone who has seen Jones run must have noticed that he's a bit downhearted. "'He's been beaten every time, and he goes into a race now expecting to be beaten, "'and is therefore beaten before he starts. "'He needs encouragement, and we have to consider that fact in arranging his handicap. "'Then there's Smith. He's too cocksure. He's never had any difficulty in beating men of his own class. He needs putting on his medal, so he increases handicap accordingly. It takes a lot of working out and a lot of thinking about, I tell you, but here they come. There was no mistake this time. A batch of runners came into sight all at once. The officials took their places, and the crowd clustered excitedly round. As we waited, the remarks to which I had just listened took powerful hold upon my mind. The handicaps of life may have been more carefully calculated and more beneficially designed than we have sometimes been inclined to suppose. 3. It was a fine finish. As the first batch of men drew nearer, I was pleased to notice that Brown, the fellow in the light blue who had started last, was among them. Gradually he drew out from the rest and, with a magnificent spurt, asserted his superiority and won the race. A few minutes later I took the tram citywards. Just as it was starting, Brown also entered the car. I could not resist the opportunity of congratulating him. "'It must have taken the heart out of you,' I said, "'to see all the other fellows getting in front of you "'and to find yourself left to the last.' "'Oh, no,' he replied with a laugh. "'It's a bit of an honour, isn't it, "'to see that they think me so much better than everyone else "'that they fancy I have a sporting chance under such conditions. "'And besides, it spurs a fellow to do his best. "'When you're accustomed to winning races, "'it doesn't feel nice to be beaten, even in a handicap, "'and to avoid being beaten, you've got to go for all you're worth.' I shook hands and left him, but I felt that he had given me something else to think about. It's a bit of an honor, he had said, and besides it spurs a fellow to do his best. The next time a man tells me he cannot help me because he is so heavily handicapped, what a tale I shall have to tell him. 4. My Saturday afternoon experience has convinced me that, in the church, we have tragically misinterpreted the significance of handicaps. I am very heavily handicapped, we say in the church, therefore I must not attempt this thing. I'm very heavily handicapped, they say out there at their sports. Therefore, I must put all my strength into it. And who can doubt that the philosophy of the churchman is false, or that the philosophy of the sportsman is sound? There is a great saying of Bacon's that every handicapped man should learn by heart. Whosoever, he says, quote, hath anything fixed in his person that doth induce contempt, hath also a perpetual spur in himself to rescue and deliver himself from scorn. End quote. Is that why so many of the world's greatest benefactors were men who bore in their bodies the marks of physical affliction, blindness, deafness, disease, and the like? They felt that they were heavily handicapped, and that their handicap called them to make a supreme effort to rescue and deliver themselves from scorn. When speaking of the difficulty which a black boy experiences in America in competing with his white rivals, Booker Washington tells us that his own pathetic and desperate struggle taught him that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed. There is a good deal in that. I was once present at a meeting of a certain borough council at which an engineer had to report on a certain proposal which the municipal authorities were discussing. The engineer contented himself with remarking that there were serious difficulties in the way of executing the plan. Whereupon the mayor turned upon the unfortunate engineer and remarked, We pay you your salary, Mr. Engineer, not to tell us that difficulties exist, but to show us how to surmount them. I thought it a rather severe rebuke at the time, but very often since, when I have been tempted to allow my handicaps to divert me from my duty, I have been glad that I heard the poor engineer censured. I was once deeply and permanently impressed by a chairman's speech at a meeting in Exeter Hall. That noble old auditorium was crowded from floor to ceiling of the annual missionary demonstration of the Wesleyan Methodist Church. The chair was occupied by Mr. W. E. Knight of Newark. In the course of a most earnest plea for missionary enthusiasm, Mr. Knight suddenly became personal. I was born in a missionary atmosphere, he said. I have lived in it ever since. I hope I shall die in it. Over forty years ago, my heart was touched with the story of the world's needs, when I heard such men as Gervais Smith, Dr. Punchin, Richard Roberts, G. T. Perks, and others, I said, Lord, here I am, send me. I came up to London forty-one years ago as a candidate for the Methodist ministry. I offered myself, but the church did not see fit to accept my offer. I remember well coming up to the college at Westminster and being told of the decision of the committee by that sainted man, William Jackson. 
I went to the little room in which I had slept with a broken heart. I despised myself. I was rejected of men, and I felt I was forsaken of God. Now here is a man heavily handicapped, but let him finish his story. In that moment of darkness, Mr. Knight continued, the deepest darkness of my life, there came to me a voice which has influenced my life from then till now. It said, if you cannot go yourself, send someone else. I was a poor boy then. I knew that I could not pay for anyone else to go. But time rolled on. I prospered in business. And tonight I shall lay on the altar a sum which I wish the committee to invest. And the interest on that sum will support a missionary in Africa, not during my lifetime only, but as long as capital is capable of earning interest. And, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that this is a red-letter day in my life. Of course it was. It was the day on which he had turned his handicap to that account for which all handicaps were intended. My handicap was an honor and a spur, said the champion in the tram car. My handicap was an honor and a spur, said the chairman at Exeter Hall. Both the champion and the chairman did by means of their handicaps what they could never have done without those handicaps. There can be no doubt about it. Handicaps were designed not as the pitiful excuses of the indolent, but as the magnificent inspirations of the brave. End of Part 2, Chapter 1 Part 2, Chapter 2 of Mushrooms on the Moor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum Part 2, Chapter 2 Gog and Magog Gog and Magog, let it be dearly understood, are the two tall poplar trees that keep ceaseless vigil by my gate. I state this fact baldly and unequivocally at the very outset in order to set at rest, once and forever, all controversies and disputations on that fascinating point. Historians will reach down the ponderous and dusty tomes that litter up their formidable shelves, and will tell me that Gog and Magog were two famous British giants whose life-size statues, fourteen feet high, have stood for more than two hundred years at Guildhall in London. But that is all that the historians know about it. Theologians, and especially theologians of a certain school, will remind me that Gog and Magog are biblical characters. Are they not mentioned in the prophecy of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation? And then, looking gravely over their spectacles, these learned-looking gentlemen will ask me if I am seriously of opinion that the inspired writers were referring to my pair of lofty poplars. I hasten to assure these nervous and unimaginative gentlemen that I propose to commit myself to no such heresy. Like Mrs. Gamp, I would not presume... For ages past, these cryptic titles have provided my excellent friends with ground for interminable speculation, and for the most ingenious exploits of interpretation. How could I have the heart to exclusively allocate to these stately sentinels that guard my gate the titles that have afforded the interpreters such endless pleasure? I would as soon attempt to snatch from a boy his only peg-top, or from a girl her only doll, as to embark upon so barbarous an atrocity." How could they ever again declare, with the faintest scrap of confidence, that Gog and Magog represented any particular pair of princes or potentates if I deliberately anticipate them by walking off with both labels and coolly attaching them to my two poplar trees? The thing is absurd upon the face of it, and so I repeat, for the purposes of this article, and for the purposes of this article only, Gog and Magog are the two tall poplar trees that keep ceaseless vigil by my gate. Trees are very lovable things. We all like Beaconsfield the better because he was so passionately devoted to the trees at Hewenden. He was so fond of them that he directed in his will that none of them should ever be cut down. So I am not ashamed of my tenderness for Gog and Magog. There they stand, down at the gate, the one on the one side and the other on the other. Huge giants they are, with a giant's strength and a giant's stature, but with more than a giant's grace. From whichever direction I come, they always seem to salute me with a welcome as soon as I come round the bend in the road. It is always pleasant when home has something about it that can be seen at a distance. The last half-mile on the homeward road is the half-mile in which the climax of weariness is reached. It is like the last straw that breaks the camel's back. But if there is a light at the window or some clear landmark that distinguishes the spot, the very sight of the familiar object lures the travel on, and in actual sight of home he forgets his fatigue. It is a very pleasant thing to have two glorious poplars at your gate. They always seem to be craning, straining, towering upward to catch the first glimpse of you, and they make home seem nearer as soon as you come within sight of them. Gog and Magog are such companionable things. They always have something to say to you. It is true that they talk of little but the weather, but then that is what most people talk about. I like to see them in August, when a certain olive sheen mantles their branches and tells you that the swallows will soon be there. 
i like to see them in october when they are a towering column of verdure every leaf as bright as though it has just been varnished i even like to see them in april when they strew the paths with a rustling litter of bronze and gold they tell me that winter is coming with its long evenings its roaring fires and its insistence on the superlative attractions of home there never dawns a day on which gog and magog are not well worth looking at and well worth listening to but although i have been speaking of gog and magog as though they were as much alike as two peas the very reverse is the case no two things not even two peas are exactly alike when god makes a thing he breaks the mould the two peas do not resemble each other under a microscope macaulay in his essay on madame d'arblay declares that this extraordinary range of distinctions within very narrow limits is one of the most notable things in the universe no two faces are alike he says and yet very few faces deviate very widely from the common standard among the millions of human beings who inhabit london there is not one who could be taken by his acquaintance for another yet we may walk from paddington to mile end without seeing one person in whom any feature is so overchanged that we turn around to stare at it an infinite number of varieties lies between limits which are not very far asunder the specimens which pass those limits on either side form a very small minority so it is with trees when you first drive up an avenue of poplars you regard each tree as the exact duplicate of all the others there is certainly a general similarity just as in some households there is a striking family likeness but just as after spending a few days with that household you no longer mistake jack for charlie or jesse for jean and even laugh at yourself for having been so stupid so when you get to know the poplars better you no longer suppose that they are all alike you soon detect the marks of individuality among them and if one were felled and brought to you you could describe with perfect accuracy the two trees between which it stood this is particularly the case with gog and magog a casual visitor would remark as he approached the house that we had a pair of gigantic poplars at the front gate it does not occur to him to distinguish between them for aught he knows or for aught he cares gog might be magog or magog might be gog but to us the thing is absurd we know them so well that we should as soon think of mistaking one of the children for another as of mistaking gog for magog or magog for gog we salute the tall trees every morning when we rise we pass them with mystic greetings of our own a dozen times a day and before retiring at night we like to peep from the front windows and see their gigantic forms grandly silhouetted against the evening sky gog is gog and magog is magog and the idea of mistaking the one for the other seems ludicrous in the extreme the solar system is as full of mysteries as a conjurer's portmanteau but of all the mysteries that it contains the mystery of individuality is surely the most inscrutable of all what is the difference between gog and magog somebody wants to know and i am glad that somebody asked the question for it gives me the opportunity of pointing out that between gog and magog there is all the difference in the world there is a difference in girth there is a difference in height and there is a difference in fibre i have just run a tape around both trees magog gives a measurement of just six feet whilst gog puts those puny proportions to shame with a record of seven feet six inches i have not attempted to climb the trees but i can see at a glance that gog is at least eight feet taller than his brother nor do those measurements sum up the whole of gog's advantage for you cannot glance at the twins without seeing that gog is incalculably the sturdier in the trunk of magog there is a huge cavity into which a child could creep and be perfectly concealed but gog is as sound as a bell any one who has seen two brothers grow up side by side the one sturdy masculine virile and full of health the other puny delicate fragile and threatened with disease knows how i feel whenever i pass between these two sentries at the gate i am full of admiration for the glorious strength of gog i am touched to tenderness by the comparative frailty of poor magog it is odd that two trees of the same age growing together under precisely identical conditions should have turned out so differently there must be a reason for it is there there is the fact is gog gets all the wind i have often watched the storm come sweeping down on the two tall trees and it is grand to watch them the huge things sway and bend like tossing plumes and sometimes you almost fancy that they will break like reeds before the fury of the blast great branches are torn off smaller boughs and piles of twigs are scattered all around like wounded soldiers on a hotly contested field but the trees outlive the storm and you love them all the better for it but all the time you can see that it is gog that is doing the fighting the fearful onslaught breaks first upon him and the force of the attack is broken by the time it reaches magog it may be that gog is very fond of magog and pitying his frailty seeks to shelter him it certainly looks like it 
but if so it is a mistaken kindness it is just because gog has had to bear the brunt of so many attacks that he has sent down his roots so deeply and has become so magnificently strong it is because magog has always been protected and sheltered that he is so feeble and cut so sorry a figure beside his stouter brother and now i find myself sitting at the feet of gog and magog not only literally but metaphorically and they begin to teach me things it is not half a bad thing to be living in a world that has some fight in it it is a good thing for a man to be buffeted and knocked about i fancy that gog and magog could say some specially comforting things to parents the tendency among us is to try to secure for our children the kind of life that magog leads hidden sheltered and protected yet nobody can take a second glance at poor magog his shorter stature his smaller girth his softer fibre without entertaining the gravest doubts concerning the wisdom of so apparently considered a choice it is perfectly natural and altogether creditable to the fond hearts and earnest solicitude of doting parents that they should seek to rear their children like hothouse plants protected from the nipping frosts and frigid blasts of a chilling world but it can be overdone a great meeting attended by five thousand people was recently held in london to deal with the white slave question and i was greatly struck by the fact that one of the most experienced and observant of the speakers the rev j ernest rattenbury of the west london mission declared with deep emotion and impressive emphasis that quote, it is the girls who come from the sheltered homes who stand in the greatest peril end quote. perhaps i shall render the most practical service if i put the truth the other way instead of dwelling so much on magog look at gog i know fathers and mothers who are inclined to break their hearts because their boys and girls have had to go out from the shielding care of their homes into the rough and tumble of the world look at gog i say again look at gog was it not alfred russell wallace who tried to help an emperor moth and only harmed it by his ill-considered ministry he came upon the creature beating its wings and struggling wildly to force its passage through the narrow neck of its cocoon he admired its fine proportions eight inches from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other and thought it a pity that so handsome a creature should be subjected to so severe an ordeal he therefore took out his lancet and slit the cocoon the moth came out at once but its glorious colours never developed the soaring wings never expanded the indescribable hues and tints and shades that should have adorned them never appeared the moth crept moodily about drooped perceptibly and presently died the furious struggle with the cocoon was nature's wise way of developing the splendid wings and of sending vital fluids pulsing through the frame until every particle blushed with their beauty the naturalist had saved the little creature from the struggle but had unintentionally ruined and slain it in the process it is the story of gog and magog over again in my college days i used to go down to a quaint little english village for the weekend in order to conduct services in the village chapel on sunday i was always entertained by a little old lady whose face haunts me still it was so very human and so very wise and withal and so very beautiful and the white ringlets on either side completed a perfect picture she dwelt in a modest little cottage on top of the hill it was a queer tumble-down old place with crooked rafters and crazy lattice windows roses and honeysuckle clambered all over the porch straggled along the walls and even crept under the eaves into the cottage itself the thing that impressed me when i first went was the extraordinary number of old bessie's visitors on saturday nights they came one after another young men and sedate matrons old men and tripping maidens and each desired to see her alone she was very old she had known hunger and poverty the deeply furrowed brow told of long and bitter trouble she was a great sufferer too and daily wrestled with her pitiless disease but like the sturdier of the poplars by my gate she had gathered into herself the force of all the cruel winds that had beaten so savagely upon her and the result was that her own character had become so strong and so upright and so beautiful that she was recognized as the high priestess of that english countryside and every man and maiden who needed counsel or succor made a beaten path to her open door End of part two, chapter two. Part two, chapter three of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part two, chapter three. My wardrobe changing your mind is for all the world like changing your clothes you may easily make a mistake especially if the process is performed in the dark 
and as a matter of fact a man is usually more or less in the dark at the moment in which he changes his mind an absent-minded friend of mine went upstairs the other day to prepare for a social function to the consternation of his unhappy wife he came down again wearing his old gardening suit a man may quite easily make a mistake before he enters upon the process of robing he must be sure of three things one he must be quite clear that the clothes he proposes to doff are unsuitable two he must be sure that his wardrobe contains more appropriate apparel three and he must be certain that the folded garments that he takes from the drawer are actually those that he has made up his mind to wear it is a good thing similarly to change one's mind but the thing must be done very deliberately and even with scientific precision or a man may make himself perfectly ridiculous let me produce a pair of illustrations one from boswell which is good and one from the bible which is better one dr samuel johnson was a frequent visitor in the house of mr richardson the famous novelist one day whilst johnson was there hogarth called hogarth soon started a discussion with mr richardson as to the justice of the execution of dr cameron while he was talking he perceived a person standing at the window in the room shaking his head and rolling himself about in a strange ridiculous manner he concluded that he was an idiot whom his relations had put under the care of mr richardson as being a very good man to his great surprise however this figure stalked forwards to where he and mr richardson were sitting and all at once took up the argument he displayed such a power of eloquence that hogarth looked at him with astonishment and actually imagined that he was inspired thus far boswell two paul was shipwrecked as everyone knows at malta he was gathering sticks for the fire when a viper thawed by the warm flesh and fierce flame fastened on his finger when the natives saw the snake hanging on his hand they regarded it as a judgment and said that no doubt he was a murderer but when they saw that he was none the worse for the bite they changed their minds and said that he was a god hogarth thought johnson was a lunatic he changed his mind and said he was inspired the maltese thought paul was a murderer they changed their minds and said he was a god they were all wrong and always wrong it is the case of my poor absent-minded friend over again it was quite clear that his clothes wanted changing but he put on the wrong suit it was evident that hogarth's verdict on johnson wanted revising but he rushed from scylla to charbidus it was manifest that the maltese view of paul needed correcting but they swung like a pendulum from one ludicrous extreme to the opposite in each case the hero reappears wearing the wrong clothes in each case he only makes himself ridiculous if my mind wants changing i must be very cautious as to the way in which i do it and of course a man must sometimes change both his clothes and his mind his mind at any rate how can you go to a conjuring entertainment for example without changing your mind a hundred times in the course of the performance for a second you think that the vanished billiard is here then in a trice you change your mind and conclude that it is there first you believe that appearances notwithstanding the magician really has no hat in his hand then in a flash you change your mind and you fancy he has two you think for a moment that the clever trick is done in this way and then you become certain that it is only done in that i once witnessed in london a very clever artist who walked up and down the stage passing midway behind a screen and as he reappeared on the other side after having been hidden from sight for only a fraction of a second he was differently dressed he stepped behind the screen a soldier and emerged a policeman he disappeared a huntsman he reappeared a clergyman he went a convict he became again a sailor he wore a score of uniforms in almost as many seconds i began by saying that changing your mind is for all the world like changing your clothes it is less tedious however i have no idea how my london friend managed to change his garments many times in a minute but many a magician has made me change my mind at a lightning pace yes many a magician for the universe is after all a kind of magic the wand of the wizard is at its wonderful work it is the highest type of legerdemain it is very weird and very wonderful a thing of marvel and mystery no man can sit down and gaze for five minutes with wide open eyes upon god's worlds without changing his mind at least five times the man who never changes his mind will soon discover to his shame that he is draped in intellectual rags and tatters i rather think that macaulay's illustration is as good as any a traveller he says in his essay on sir james mackintosh quote, falls in with a berry which he has never before seen he tastes it and finds it sweet and refreshing he presses it and resolves to introduce it into his own country but in a few minutes he is taken violently sick he is convulsed he is at the point of death 
he of course changes his mind pronounces this delicious food a poison blames his own folly in tasting it and cautions his friends against it after a long and violent struggle he recovers and finds himself much exhausted by his sufferings but free from the chronic complaints which had been the torment of his life he then changes his mind again and pronounces this fruit a very powerful remedy which ought to be employed only in extreme cases and with great caution but which ought not to be absolutely excluded from the pharmacopoeia would it not be the height of absurdity to call such a man fickle and inconsistent because he had repeatedly altered his judgment of course it would a man cannot go all through life wearing the same suit of clothes for two reasons it will not always fit and it will wear out and in precisely the same way and for identically similar reasons a man must sometimes change his opinions it is refreshing to think of augustine carefully compiling a list of mistakes that had crept into his writings so that he might take every opportunity of repudiating and correcting them i never consult my copies of archbishop trench's great works on the parables and the miracles without glancing always with a glow of admiration at that splendid sentence with which the publisher's note concludes Quote, the author never allowed his books to be stereotyped in order that he might consistently improve them and permanence has only become possible now that this diligent hand can touch the work no more End quote. that always strikes me as being very fine but the thing must be done methodically let me not rush upstairs and change my clothes or my mind for the mere sake of making a change nor must i tumble into the first suit that i happen to find in either wardrobe when i reappear the change must command itself to the respect if not the admiration of my fellows i do not want men to laugh at my change as we have laughed at these maltese natives at old hogarth and my absent-minded friend i want to be quite sure that the clothes that i doff are the wrong clothes and the clothes that i don are the right ones mr gladstone once thought out very thoroughly this whole question as to how frequently and how radically a man may change his mental outfit without forfeiting the confidence of those who have come to value his judgments and as a result of that hard thinking the great man reached a half dozen very clear and very concise conclusions one he concluded that a change of front is very often not only permissible but creditable a change of mind he says quote, is a sign of life if you are alive you must change it is only the dead who remain the same i have changed my point of view on a score of subjects and my convictions as to many of them End quote. two he concluded that a great change involving a drastic social cleavage not unlike a change in religion should certainly occur not more than once in a lifetime three he concluded that a great and cataclysmic change should never be sudden or precipitate four he concluded that no change ought to be characterized by a contemptuous repudiation of old memories and old associations five he concluded that no change ought to be regarded as final or worthy of implicit confidence if it involved the convert in temporal gain or worldly advantage six and he concluded that any change to command respect must be frankly confessed and not be hooded slurred over or denied all this is good as far as it goes but even mr gladstone must not be too hard on sudden and cataclysmic changes what about saul on the road to damascus what about augustine that morning in his garden what about brother lawrence and the dry tree what about stephen grellet in the american forest what about luther on Pilate's staircase what about bunyan and newton and wesley and spurgeon what about the tales that harold begbie tells and what about the work of general booth professor james in his varieties of religious experience has a good deal to say that would lead mr gladstone to yet one more change of mind concerning the startling suddenness with which the greatest of all changes may be precipitated and this too must be said every wise man has locked away in his heart a few treasures that he will never either give or sell or exchange it is a mistake to suppose that all our opinions are open to revision they are not there are some things too sacred to always be open to scrutiny and investigation no self-respecting man will spend his time inquiring as to his wife's probity and honor he makes up his mind as to that when he marries her and henceforth the question is settled it is not open to review he would feel insulted if an investigation were suggested it is only the small things of life that we are eternally questioning we are reverently restful and serenely silent about the biggest things of all a man does not discuss his wife's virtue or his soul's salvation on the curbstone the martyrs all went to their deaths with brave hearts and mourning faces because they were not prepared to reconsider or review the greatest decision they had ever made there are some things on which no wise man will think of changing his mind 
and he will decline to contemplate a change because he knows that his wardrobe holds no better garb it is of no use doffing the robes of princes to don the rags of paupers eighty and six years have i served christ exclaimed the triumphant polycarp and he mounted the heavens in wreathing smoke and leaping flame rather than change his mind after so long and so lovely an experience end of part three chapter two part two chapter four of mushrooms on the moor this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by lillis mushrooms on the moor by frank w borum part two chapter four pity my simplicity it was a sultry summer's day a hundred and fifty years ago and john wesley was on the rocky road to dublin Quote, the wind being in my face tempering the heat of the sun i had a pleasant ride to dublin in the evening i began expounding the deepest part of the holy scripture namely the first epistle of john by which above all other even above all other inspired writings i advise every young preacher to form his style here are sublimity and simplicity together the strongest sense in the plainest language how can any one that would speak as the oracles of god use harder words than are to be found here End quote. With which illuminating extract from the great man's journal we may dismiss him, the road to Dublin, and the text from which he preached in the Irish capital altogether. I have no further business with any of them. The thing that concerns me is the suggestive declaration made by the most experienced preacher of all time, that sublimity and simplicity always go hand in hand. Here in this deepest part of Holy Scripture, says the Master, are sublimity and simplicity together. Quote, by this above all other writings i advise every preacher to form his style how can any one that would speak as the oracles of god use harder words than are to be found here End quote. such words from such a source are like apples of gold and pictures of silver and i am thankful that i chanced to come upon the great man that hot july night in dublin and gather this distilled essence of wisdom as it fell from his eloquent lips i have often wondered why we teach children to pray that their simplicity might be pitied gentle jesus meek and mild look upon a little child pity my simplicity suffer me to come to thee why pity my simplicity it is the one thing about a little child that is really sublime sublimity and simplicity as we learned at dublin everlastingly inseparable pity my simplicity why it is the sweetest simplicity of a little child that we all admire and love and covet pity my simplicity why it is the unspoiled and sublime simplicity of this little child of mine that takes my heart by storm and carries everything before it and depend upon it the heart of the divine father is affected not very differently this soft sweet little white-robed thing that kneels on my knee with its arms around my neck lisping its gentle jesus meek and mild look upon a little child pity my simplicity suffer me to come to thee shames me by its very sublimity it outstrips me transcends me and leaves me far behind it soars whilst i grovel it flies whilst i creep that is what jesus meant when he took a little child and set him in the midst of the disciples and said whosoever shall humble himself as this little child the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven the simplest he meant is always the sublimest and it was because the great methodist had so perfectly caught the spirit of his great master that he declared so confidently that night in dublin simplicity and sublimity lie here together it is always and everywhere the same in literature sublimity is represented by the poet what could be more sublime than the inspired imagination of milton and yet and yet the very greatest of all our literary critics in his essay on milton feels it incumbent upon him to point out that imagination is essentially the domain of childhood of all people he says quote, children are the most imaginative they abandon themselves without reserve to every illusion every image which is strongly presented to their mental eye produces on them the effect of reality no man whatever his sensibility may be is ever affected by hamlet or lear as a little girl is affected by the story of poor red riding hood she knows that it is all false that wolves cannot speak and there are no wolves in england yet in the spirit of the knowledge she believes she weeps she trembles she dares not go into a dark room lest she should feel the teeth of the monster at her throat End quote. and from these premises macaulay proceeds to his inevitable conclusion Quote, he who in an enlightened and literary society aspires to be a great poet must he says first become a little child he must take to pieces the whole web of his mind he must unlearn much of that knowledge which has perhaps constituted hitherto his chief title to superiority his very talents will be a hindrance to him 
his difficulties will be proportioned to his proficiency in the pursuits which are fashionable among his contemporaries and that proficiency will in general be proportioned to the vigour and activity of his mind End quote. could there be any finer comment on the words of the master simplicity and sublimity always go together said john wesley that hot july night at dublin whosoever shall humble himself as this little child the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven said the master on that memorable day in galilee he who aspires to be a great poet must first become a little child says lord macaulay in his incomparable essay on milton i have carefully put the master in his old place he is in the midst with the very greatest of our modern apostles on the one side of him and the very greatest of our modern historians on the other but they are all three of them saying the same thing each in his own way it is a pity that we teach our children that the sublimest thing about them their simplicity is a thing of which they need to be ashamed and the way in which their tiny tongues stumble over the great word seems to show that following a true instinct they do not take kindly to that clause in their bedtime prayer i am told that away above the never never ranges there is a church from which the children are excluded before the sermon begins i wish my informant had not told me of its existence i am not often troubled with nightmare my supper being quite a frugal affair but just occasionally i find myself a victim of the terror by night and when i am mercifully awakened and asked why i am gasping so horribly and perspiring so freely i have to confess that i was dreaming that i had somehow become the minister of that childless congregation as is usual after nightmare i look round with a sense of inexpressible thankfulness on discovering that it was only a horrid dream an appointment to such a charge would be to me a most fearsome and terrifying prospect i could not trust myself in a way i envy the man who can hold his own under such circumstances his transcendent powers enable him to preserve his sturdy humanness of character his charming simplicity of diction his graphic picturesqueness of phrase and his exquisite winsomeness of behaviour without the extraneous assistance which the children render to some of us but i could not do it i should go all to pieces and so when i dream that i have entered a pulpit from which i can survey no roguish young faces and mischievous wide-open eyes i fancy i am ruined and undone i watch with consternation as the little people file out during the hymn before the sermon and i know that the sermon is doomed the children in the congregation are my salvation i fancy that the custom to which i have referred was in vogue in the church to which the rev bruno leithwaite chilvers ministered everybody knows mr chilvers at least everybody who loves george gissing knows that very excellent gentleman mr chilvers loved to adorn his dainty discourses with certain words of strangely grandiloquent sound nullifidian morbific renascent these were among his favourites once or twice he spoke of psychogenesis with an emphatic enunciation which seemed to invite respectful wonder in using latin words which have become fixed in the english language he generally corrected the common errors of quantity and pronounced the words as nobody else did he often alluded to french and german authors in order that he might recite french and german quotations and so on poor mr chilvers i am sure that the little children filed out during the hymn before the sermon no man with a scrap of imagination could look into the dimpled face of a little girl i know and hurl nullifidian at her no man could look down into a certain pair of sparkling eyes that are wonderfully familiar to me and talk about things as morbific or renascent if only the little tots had kept their seats for the sermon it would have saved poor mr chilvers from committing such atrocities as it is they went and he collapsed can anybody imagine john wesley talking to a summer evening crowd at dublin about nullifidian or quoting german i will say nothing of the galilean preacher the common people heard him gladly he was so simple and therefore so sublime as sir edwin arnold says the simplest sights he met the sower flinging seed on loam and rock the darnel in the wheat the mustard tree that hath its seed so little and its boughs wide spreading and the wandering sheep and nets shot in the wimpled waters drawing forth great fish and small these and a hundred such seen by us daily never seen aright were pictures for him from the page of life teaching by parable therein lies the sublimity of it all a little child especially a little child of a distinctly restless and mischievous propensity is really a great help to a minister and it is a shame to deprive the good man of such assistance it is only by such help that some of us can hope to approximate to real sublimity lord beaconsfield used to say that in making after-dinner speeches he kept his eye on the waiters if they were unmoved he knew that he was in the realms of mediocrity but when they grew excited and waved their napkins he knew that he was getting home lord cockburn who was for some time lord chief justice of great britain 
when asked for the secret of his extraordinary success at the bar replied sagely quote, when i was addressing a young jury i invariably picked out the stupidest looking fellow of the lot and addressed myself specially to him for this good reason i knew that if i convinced him i should be sure to carry all the rest End quote. dr thomas guthrie in addressing the gatherings of ministers used to tell this story of lord cockburn with immense relish and earnestly commended its philosophy to their consideration I was reading the other day that Dr. Boyd Carpenter, formerly Bishop of Ripon, and now Canon of Westminster, on being asked if he felt nervous when preaching before Queen Victoria, replied, quote, I never address the Queen at all. I know there will be present the Queen, the Princes, the Household, and the Servants, down to the scullery maid, and I preach to the scullery maid. End quote. Little children do not attend political dinners such as Lord Beaconsfield adorned, nor courts of justice such as Lord Cockburn addressed, nor royal chapels like that in which Dr. Boyd Carpenter officiated and in the absence of the children the only chance of reaching sublimity that offered itself to these unhappy orators lay in making good use of the waiter the stupid juryman and the scullery maid if the rev bruno leithwright chilvers really cannot induce the children to abandon the bad habit in which they have been trained i urge him as a friend and a brother to adopt the same ingenious expedient but if he can get on the right side of a little child persuade him to sit the sermon out and vow that he will look straight into that bright little face and say no word that will not interest that tiny listener i promise that before long people will say that his sermons are simply sublime robert louis stevenson knew what he was doing when he discussed every sentence of treasure island with his schoolboy stepson before giving it its final form it was by that wise artifice that one of the greatest stories in our language came to be written the fact, of course, is that in the soul's sublimest moments it hungers for simplicity. One of Dr. Morier's great punch cartoons represented a honeymoon conversation between a husband and a wife who had both covered themselves with glory at Cambridge. And the conversation ran along these highly intellectual lines. What would Lovey do if Dovey died? Oh, Lovey would die too. There is a world of philosophy behind the nonsense. We do not make love in the language of the psychologist. We make love in the language of the little child. When life approaches to sublimity, it always expresses itself with simplicity. In the depth of mortal anguish, or at the climax of human joy, we do not use a grandiloquent and incomprehensible phraseology. We talk in monosyllables. As we grow old and draw near to the gates of the grave, we become more and more simple. In his declining years, John Newton wrote, quote, When I was young, I was sure of many things. There are only two things of which I'm sure now. One is that I'm a miserable sinner, and the other that Christ is an all-sufficient Savior. End quote. What is this but the soul garbing itself in the most perfect sublimities as the only fitting raiment in which it can greet the everlasting sublimities? Here are sublimity and simplicity together, exclaimed John Wesley on that hot July night at Dublin. How can any one that would speak as the oracles of God use harder words than are to be found here? By this I advise every young preacher to form his style. He who aspires to be a great poet, as sublime as Milton, must first become a little child declares the greatest of all literateurs whosoever shall humble himself as this little child the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven says the master himself taking a little child and setting him in the midst of them pity my simplicity says this little thing with its soft arms around my neck give me that simplicity say i end of part two chapter four part two chapter five of mushrooms on the moor this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 2, Chapter 5. Tuning from the Bass. I'm about to say a good word for fear. Fear is a fine thing, a very fine thing, and the world would be a poor place without it. Fear was one of our firmest but gentlest nurses. Terror was one of our sternest but kindest teachers. A very wise man once said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He might have left out the august and holy name and still have stated a tremendous fact, for fear is always the beginning of wisdom. No fear is no grace, said James in the second part of the Pilgrim's Progress, and Mr. Greatheart seemed of pretty much the same opinion. They were discussing poor Mr. Fearing. Mr. Fearing, said Greatheart, quote, was one that played upon the bass. Some say that the bass is the ground of music. The first string that the musician touches is the bass, when he intends to put all in tune. God also plays upon this string first when he sets the soul in tune for himself. Only here was the imperfection of Mr. Fearing. He could play upon no other music but this till towards his latter end. end quote. 
here then we have the principle stated as well as it is possible to state it you must tune from the bass for the bass is the basis of music but you must rise from the bass as a building must rise from its foundations or the music will be a moan and a monotone the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom but the wisdom that gets no farther is like music that rumbles and reverberates in one everlasting bass but the finest exposition of the inestimable value of fear is not by john bunyan it is by jack london white fang is the greatest story of the inner life of an animal that has ever been contributed to our literature and jack london who seems to have got into the very soul of a wolf shows us how the wonderful character of white fang was moulded and fashioned by fear first there was the mere physical fear of pain the dread of hurting his tender little nose as the tiny gray cub explored the dark recesses of the lair the horror of his mother's paw that smote him down whenever he approached the mouth of the cave and later on the fear of the steep bank learned by a terrible fall the fear of the yielding water learned by attempting to walk upon it and the fear of the ptarmigan's beak and the weasel's teeth learned by robbing their respective nests and following on the physical fear of pain came the reverential fear of power his mother represented power jack london says Quote, and as he grew older he felt this power in the sharp admonition of her paw while the reproving nudge of her nose gave place to the slash of her fangs for this he respected his mother End quote. and afterwards when he came upon the red indians and saw men for the first time a still greater fear possessed him here were creatures who made the very sticks and stones obey them they seemed to him as gods and he felt that he must worship and serve them and later still when he saw white men living not in wigwams but in great palaces of stone he trembled as he had never trembled before these were superior gods and as everyone knows white fang passed from fearing them to knowing them and from knowing them to loving them and at last he became their fond devoted slave it is true that fear was to white fang only the beginning of wisdom but that is precisely what solomon says afterwards the brave old wolf learned fearlessness but the early lessons taught by fear were still of priceless value for to courage they added caution and courage wedded to caution is irresistible we are living in times that are wonderfully meek and mild and fear the stern old schoolmaster is looked upon with suspicion it is curious how we reverse the fashions of our ancestors we flaunt in shameless abandon what they veiled in blushing modesty but we make up for it by hiding what they had no hesitation in displaying our teeth for example it is considered the depth of impropriety to show your teeth nowadays except in the sense in which actresses show them on postcards but our forefathers were not afraid of showing their teeth and they made themselves feared and honoured and loved in consequence yes feared and honoured and loved for i gravely doubt if any man ever yet taught others to honour and love him who had not first taught them on occasion to fear him the best illustration of what i mean occurs in the story of the irish movement in the politics of the last century there has been nothing so dramatic nothing so pathetic and nothing so tragic as the story of the rise and fall of parnell lord morley's tense and vivid chapters on that phase of modern statesmanship are far more thrilling and far more affecting than a simple number of pages of any novel in the english language with the tragic fall of the irish leader we need not now concern ourselves but how are we to account for the meteoric rise of parnell and for the phenomenal power that he wielded for years he was the most effective figure in british politics there is only one explanation and it is the explanation on which practically all historians of the period agree charles stuart purnell made it the first article of his creed that he must make himself feared his predecessor in the leadership of the irish party was isaac butt mr butt believed in conciliation he was opposed to a policy of exasperation he thought that if the irishmen in the house exercised patience and considered the convenience of the two great political parties they would appeal to the good sense of the british people and ensure the success of their cause and in return to quote from mr winston churchill's life of his father the two great parties treated mr butt and the irish members with quote, that form of respect which being devoid of the element of fear is closely akin to contempt End quote. then arose parnell he held that the irishmen must make themselves the terror of the nation they must embarrass and confuse the english leaders and throw the whole political machinery of both parties hopelessly out of gear and in a few months mr parnell made the irish question the supreme question in the mind of the nation and became for years the most hated and the most beloved personality on the parliamentary horizon nobody who knows the history of that troublous time can doubt that but for the moral shipwreck of parnell a shipwreck that nearly broke mr gladstone's heart the whole irish question would have been settled for better or worse twenty years ago with the merits or demerits of his cause i am not now dealing 
but everybody who has read lord morley's life of gladstone or mr barry o'brien's life of parnell must have been impressed by this striking and dramatic picture of a lonely and extraordinary man espousing an apparently hopeless cause deliberately selecting fear as the weapon of his warfare and actually leading his little band of astonished followers within sight of victory it is ridiculous to say that fear possesses no moral value whenever i hear that contention stated my mind invariably swings back to a great story told by sir henry hawkins in his reminiscences he is telling of his experiences under mr justice maul and is praising the judicial perspicacity of that judge in a certain murder case a boy of eight was called to give evidence and counsel objected to so youthful a witness being heard mr justice maul thought for a minute and then beckoned the boy to the bench i should like to know his honour observed what you have been taught to believe what will become of you my little boy when you die if you are so wicked as to tell a lie hellfire answered the boy with great promptitude but do you mean to say the judge went on that you would go to hellfire for telling any lie hellfire sir the boy replied again to several similar questions the boy made the same terrible response he does not seem to be competent said the counsel i beg your pardon returned the judge this boy thinks that for every wilful fault he will go to hellfire and he is very likely while he believes that doctrine to be most strict in his observance of truth if you and i believed that such would be the penalty for every act of misconduct we committed we should be better men than we are let the boy be sworn sir henry hawkins tells the story with evident approval so that we have here the valuable testimony of two distinguished judges to the moral value of fear from a purely judicial point of view of course the value is not stable or permanent the goodness that arises from fear is like the tameness of a terrified tiger or the willingness of a wolf to leave the deer unharmed when both are flying from before a prairie fire when the fear passes the bloodlust will return but that is not the point nobody said that fear was wisdom what the wise men said was that fear is the beginning of wisdom and as the beginning of wisdom it has a certain initial and preparatory value the sooner that the beginning is developed and brought to a climax the better of course it will be but meanwhile a beginning is something it is a step in the right direction it is the learning of the alphabet it is the earnest and promise of much that is to come now if the church refuses to employ this potent weapon she is very stupid a beginning is only a beginning but it is a beginning if we ignore the element of terror we are deliberately renouncing a force which in the wilds and in the world is really of first-class value and importance i am not now saying that the ministry would be untrue to its high calling if it failed to warn men with gravity and with tears that is a matter of such sacredness and solemnity that i hesitate to touch it here although it is obvious that under any conceivable method of interpretation there is a terrible note of urgency in the new testament that no pulpit can decline without grave responsibility to echo but i am content to point out here that from a purely tactical point of view the church would be very foolish to scout this valuable weapon the element of fear is one of the great primal passions and to all those deep basic human elements the gospel makes its peculiar appeal and the fears of men must be excited the music cannot be all bass but the bass note must not be absent or the music will be ruined there are still those who far from being cowards may like noah be moved to fear to the saving of their houses cardinal manning tells in his journal how as a boy at tetteridge he read again and again of the lake that burneth with fire these words he says quote, became fixed in my mind and kept me as a boy and a youth and a man in the midst of all evil i owe to them more than will ever be known to the last day End quote. and archbishop benson used to tell of a working man who was seen looking at a placard announcing a series of addresses on the four last things after he had read the advertisement he turned to a companion and asked where would you and i have been without hell and the archbishop used to inquire whether if we abandoned the legitimate appeal to human fear we should not need some other motive in our preaching to fill the vacant place i know of course that all this may be misconstrued but the wise will understand the naturalist will not blame me for fear is the life of the forest the humanitarian can say no word of censure for fear is intensely human but the preacher who strikes this deep bass note must strike it very soulfully no man should be able to speak on such things except with a sob in his throat and tears in his eyes we must warn men to flee from the wrath to come but that wrath is the wrath of a lamb andrew bonner one day told murray mccain that he had just preached a sermon on hell and were you able to preach it with tenderness mccain wistfully inquired fear is a part of that wondrous instrument on the chords of which the minister is called at times to play but this chord must be struck with trembling fingers 
no mistake can be more fatal than to set off this aspect of things against more attractive themes all truth is related some years ago in scotland an express train stopped abruptly on a curve at the time of a great flood just in front of the train was a roaring chasm from which the viaduct had been swept away just behind the train was the mangled frame of the girl who had warned the driver it is impossible to understand that sacrifice lying just behind the guard's van unless you have seen the yawning chasm just in front of the engine no fears no grace said james and this i took very great notice of said mr greatheart quote, that the valley of the shadow of death was as quiet while mr fearing went through it as ever i knew it before or since and when he came to the river without a bridge i took notice of what was very remarkable the water of that river was lower at this time than ever i saw it in all my life so he went over at last not much above wet shod fear had done its work and done it well the bass notes had proved the foundation of a music that blended at last with the very harmonies of heaven fear even with white fang led on to love and perfect love casteth out fear end of part two chapter five part two chapter six of mushrooms on the moor this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by lillis mushrooms on the moor by frank w borham part two chapter six a fruitless deputation it was in new zealand and i was attending my first conference i had only a month or two earlier entered the christian ministry i dreaded the assembly of my grave and reverend seniors with becoming modesty i stole quietly into the hall and occupied a back seat from this welcome seclusion however i was rudely summoned to receive the right hand of fellowship from the president then i once more plunged into the outer darkness of oblivion and obscurity here i remained until once again i was electrified at the sound of my own name it seemed that the sorrows of dissension had overtaken a tiny church in a remote bush district one of the oldest and most revered members the father of a very large family and the leader of the little brotherhood had intimated his intention of withdrawing from fellowship and joining another denomination this formidable secession had thrown the little congregation into helpless confusion and an appeal was made to the courts of the denomination the letter was read and the secretary stated briefly and succinctly the facts of the situation and then to my amazement he closed by moving that mr william forbury and myself be appointed a deputation to visit the district to advise the church and to report to the conference mr forbury he explained was a father in israel his gray hairs commanded reverence whilst his ripe experience and sound judgment would be invaluable to the small and troubled community so far so good his reasoning seemed irresistible but he went on to say that he had included my name because i was an absolute stranger i knew nothing of the internal disputes that had rent the church my very freshness would give me a position of impartiality that older men could not claim moreover he argued the visit to a bush congregation and the insight into its particular difficulties would be a useful experience for me i felt that i could not decently decline but i confidently expected that the proposal would be challenged and probably rejected to my astonishment however it was seconded and carried and nothing remained but to arrange with mr forbury the date of our delegation the day came and we set out it took the train just four hours to convey us to the lonely station from which we emerged upon a wilderness of green bush and a maze of muddy tracks mr forbury had visited the district frequently and knew it well we called upon several settlers in the course of the afternoon taking dinner with one and afternoon tea with another and then we proceeded to the home of the seceder the place seemed alive with young people the house swarmed with children how are you john inquired my companion ah william glad to see you how are you they made an interesting study these two old men their forms were bent with long years of hard and honourable toil their faces were rugged and weather-beaten wrinkled with age and furrowed with care they had come out together from the homeland years and years ago they had borne each other's burdens and shared each other's confidences through all the days of their pilgrimage their thoughts of each other were mingled with all the memories of their courtships their weddings and their earlier struggles a thousand tender and sacred associations were interwoven in the mind of each with the name of the other when fortune had smiled they had delighted in each other's prosperity in times of shadow each had hastened to the other's side they had walked together talked together laughed together wept together and very very often prayed together they had been as david and jonathan and the soul of the one was knit to the soul of the other hundreds of times before the one had come to settle in this new district they had walked to the house of god in company and now a matter of doctrine had intervened 
and with such men a matter of doctrine is a matter of conscience and a matter of conscience is the most stubborn of all obstacles to overcome i looked into their stern expressive faces and i saw that they were no triflers a fad had no charm for either of them they looked into each other's faces and each read the truth the breach was irreparable we sat in the great farm kitchen until tea-time i felt it was no business of mine to broach the affairs that had brought us several times i thought that mr forbury was about to touch the matter but each time it was adroitly avoided and the conversation swerved off in another direction once or twice i felt half inclined to precipitate a discussion indeed i was in the act of doing so when our hostess brought in the tea a snowy cloth homemade scones delicious oatcake abundance of cream how tempting it all was and how unattractive ecclesiastical conversation in comparison we sat there in the twilight for what seemed like an age talking of everything under the sun of everything that is to say save the one thing only and there brooded heavily over our spirits the consciousness that we were avoiding the one and only subject on which we were all really and deeply thinking after tea came family worship i was invited to conduct it and did so after reading a psalm from the old farm bible we all kneeled together the flickering flames of the great log fire flinging strange shadows on the whitened wall and rafters as we rose and bowed ourselves i caught myself attempting even in prayer to make obscure but fitting reference to that special circumstance that had brought us together but the reticence of my companion was contagious it was like a bridle on my tongue the sadness of it all haunted me and paralyzed my speech and i swerved off again at every threatened allusion we sat on for a while they on either side of the roomy fireplace and i between them whilst the good woman and her daughters washed up the tea things the clatter of the dishes and the babble of many voices made it impossible for us to speak freely on the subject nearest our hearts at length we rose to go i noticed on the part of my two aged companions a peculiar reluctance to separate each longed yet dreaded to speak there was evidently so much to be said and yet speech seemed so hopeless at last our friend said that he would walk a few steps with us we said good-bye to the great household and set off into the night i shall never forget that walk it was a clear frosty evening the moonlight was radiant every twig was tipped with silver the smallest object could be seen distinctly i watched the rabbits as they popped timidly in and out of the great gorse hedgerows a hare went scurrying across the field i felt all at once that i was an intruder what right had i to be in the company of these two aged brethren in the very crisis of their lifelong friendship no conference on earth could vest me with authority to invade this holy ground i made an excuse and hurried on walking some distance in front of them but the night was so still that even at a distance had a word been uttered i must have heard it i could hear the clatter of hoofs on the hard road two miles ahead i could hear the dogs barking at a farmhouse twice as far away i could hear a rabbit squealing in a trap on the fringe of a bush behind us but no word did i hear for none was uttered side by side they walked on in perfect silence i once paused and allowed them to approach they were crying like children stern old puritans they were built of the stuff that martyrs are made of either would have died a hundred deaths rather than have been false to conscience or to truth or to the other either would have died a hundred deaths to save the other from one neither could be coaxed or cowed into betraying one jot or tittle of his heart's best treasure and each knew whilst he trembled for himself that all this was true of the other as well side by side they walked for miles in that pale and silvery moonlight not one word was spoken grief had paralyzed their vocal powers and their eyes were streaming with another eloquence they wrung each other's hands at length and parted without even saying good night at the next conference it was the junior member of the deputation who presented the report he simply stated that the delegation had visited the district without having been able to reconcile the differences that had arisen in the little congregation the assembly formally adopted the report and the deputation was thanked for its services it seemed a very futile business and yet one member of that deputation has always felt that life was strangely enriched by the happenings of that memorable night it puts iron into the blood to spend an hour with men to whom the claim of conscience is supreme and who love truth with so deathless an affection that the purest and noblest of other loves cannot dethrone it end of part two chapter six part two chapter seven of mushrooms on the moor this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 2, Chapter 7. Tramp, Tramp, Tramp. 1. 
tramp 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 it was like the regular and rhythmic beat of a great machine file after file column after column i watched the troops pass by tramp 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 on they went and on and on all in perfect time and step tramp 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 it reminded me of that haunting passage that tells us that all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to make david king over all israel they could keep rank it's a suggestive record there is more in it than it appears on the surface they could keep rank right left right left tramp 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 all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to make david king over all israel two half of the art of life lies in learning to keep step it is a great thing a very great thing to be able to get on with other people let me indulge in a little autobiography i once had a most extraordinary experience an experience so altogether amazing that all subsequent experiences appear like the veriest commonplaces in comparison the fact is i was born such a thing had never happened to me before and i was utterly bewildered i did not know what to make of it my first impression was that i was all alone and that i had the solar system all to myself like robinson crusoe i fancied myself monarch of all i surveyed but then like robinson crusoe i discovered a footprint and found that the planet on which i had been so mysteriously cast was inhabited there were two of us myself and the other fellow as soon as i could devise means of locomotion i set out like robinson crusoe to find out what the other fellow was like i had a kind of instinct that sooner or later i should have to fight him i found that he differed from me in one essential particular he had hundreds of millions of heads i had but one he had hundreds of millions of feet hundreds of millions of hands hundreds of millions of ears and eyes i had but two but for all that it never occurred to me that he was greater than i myself always appeared to me to be vastly more important than the other fellow it was nothing to me that he starved so long as i had plenty of food it was nothing to me that he shivered so long as i was wrapped up snugly i do not remember that it ever once crossed my mind in the first six months of my existence that it would be a bad thing if he died with all his hundreds of millions of heads and left me all alone upon the planet i was first and he was nowhere i was everything and he was nothing why dear me i must have cut my first teeth before it occurred to me that there was room on the planet for both of us and i must have cut my wisdom teeth before i discovered that the world was on the whole more interesting to me because of his presence in it and since then i have spent some pains in a blundering unskilful kind of way in trying to make myself tolerable to him and the longer i live the more clearly i see that although he is an odd fellow at times he is very quick to respond to and reciprocate such advances he is discovering as am i that walking in step has a pleasure peculiar to itself three I said a moment ago that half the air of life lies in learning to keep step. Conversely, half the tragedy of life consists in our failure to do so. Here are Mr. and Mrs. Cardew. All lovers of Mark Rutherford know them well. They were both of them really excellent people, a minister and his wife, deeply attached to one another, and yet as wretched as wretched could be. How are you going to account for it? It is vastly important just because it is so common. Domestic difficulties rarely arise out of downright wickedness husband and wife may be as free from all outward fault as poor mr and mrs cardew mark rutherford thinks that mr cardew was chiefly to blame and his verdict is probably just a man takes a considerably longer stride than a woman but for all that it is still possible even in these days of hobble skirts for man and maid to walk in step as all true lovers know but it can only be managed by his moderating his ungainly stride to her more modest one and perhaps by her unconsciously lengthening her step under the invigorating influence of his support which is a parable mark rutherford says that quote, mr cardew had not learned the art of being happy with his wife he did not know that happiness is an art he rather did everything he could to make the relationship intolerable he demanded payment in coin stamped from his own mint and if bullion and jewels had been poured before him he would have taken no heed of them he did not take into account that what his wife said and what she felt might not be the same that persons who have no great command over language are obliged to make one word do for a dozen and that if his wife was defective at one point there were in her whole regions of unexplored excellence of faculties never encouraged and an affection to which he offered no response there is more philosophy in the cunning way in which the happy lovers in the lane accommodate their strides to the comfort of each other than we have been accustomed to suspect it is done very easily it is done almost unconsciously 
but they must be very careful to go on doing it long after they have left the leafy old lane behind them. 4. I do not mean to suggest that husbands and wives are sinners above all people on the face of the earth. By no means. Is there a club, a society, an officer, a church in the wide, wide world that does not shelter a most excellent individual whose one and only fault is that he cannot get on with anybody else? That is, of course, my way of putting it. It is not his. He would say that nobody else can get on with him. Which, again, takes our minds back to the troops. A raw Scotch lad joined that expeditionary force, and on the first parade day his mother and sister came proudly down to see him march. Jock, sad to say, was out of step. At least that's my way of putting it. But it is not the only way. Look, mother, said his fond sister. Look, they're out of step but our Jock. It is not for me to decide whether Jock is right or whether the others are. But since the others are all in step with each other, I'm afraid the presumptive evidence is rather heavily against Jock. And Jock is well known to all of us. Nobody likes him, and nobody knows why they don't like him. In many respects, he is a paragon of goodness. He loves his church, or he would not have stuck to it year in and year out as he has done. He is not self-assertive. He is willing to efface his own personality and be invisible. He is generous to a fault. Nobody is more eager to do anything for the general good. And yet, nobody likes him. The only thing against him is that he has never disciplined himself to get on with other people. He has never tried to accommodate himself to their stride. He can't keep rank. They're out a step but our jock. Poor jock. 5. I know that out of all this a serious problem emerges. The problem is this. Why should jock destroy his own personality in order to render himself an exact replica of every other man in the regiment? Is individuality an evil thing that must be wiped out and obliterated? The answer to this objection is that jock is not asked to sacrifice his personality. He is asked to sacrifice his angularity. The ideal of British discipline is not to turn men into machines, but to preserve individuality and initiative, and yet, at the same time, to make each man of as great value to his comrades as is by any means possible. In the church we do the same. Brown means well, but he is all gush. You ask him to do a thing, oh, certainly, with the greatest pleasure in the world, but you have an awkward feeling that he will undertake a thousand other duties in the same airy way, and that the chances of his doing the work and doing it well are not rosy. Smith, on the other hand, is cautious. He, too, means well, but he is unduly scared of promising more than he can creditably fulfill. And, as a matter of fact, this bogey frightens him out of doing as much as he might and should. Now here you have Brown running and Smith crawling. You know perfectly well that Brown will exhaust himself quite prematurely, and that Smith will never get there. And between Brown's excited scamper and Smith's exasperating crawl, the main host jogs along at a medium pace. Now Brown's personality is a delightful thing. You can't help loving him. His willingness is charming and his enthusiasm contagious. And Smith's steady persistence and extreme conscientiousness are most admirable. They do us all good. But if, whilst preserving and developing their personalities, we could strip them of their angularities and get them to walk in step at one steady and regular pace, tramp, 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 we should surely stand a better chance of making David high king over all Israel. 6. It is all a matter of discipline. The plowman comes up from the country with a long, ungainly stride. The city man, accustomed to crowded pavements, comes with a short and mincing step. They are drilled for a fortnight side by side, and away they go. Right, left, right, left, tramp, 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 tramp. The harmony is perfect. Jock must submit himself to the same rigid process of training. He must be firmly convinced that the stride of the regiment is too short or too long. But if on that ground he adopts a different one, nobody but his gentle and admiring sister will believe that he is right and they are wrong. Jock's isolated attitude invariably reflects upon himself. The whole regiment is out of step, he declares, drawing attention to his different stride. That is too often the trouble with Jock. The members of our church do not read their Bible, he says. It may be sadly true, but it sounds, put that way, like a claim that he is the one conscientious and regular Bible reader among them. The members of our church do not pray, he exclaims sadly. It may be that a call to prayer is urgently needed, but poor Jock puts the thing in such a light that it appears to be a claim on his part that he alone knows the way to the throne of grace. Among the faithless, faithful only he. The members of our church are not spiritually minded, he bemoans. But somehow, as he says it, it sounds suspiciously like an echo of little Jack Horner's What a good boy am I! In the correspondence of Elizabeth Fry there occurs a very striking and suggestive passage. When Mrs. Fry began to meet with great success in her work among the English prisons, some of the Quakers feared that her triumphs would engender pride in her own soul and destroy her spirituality. 
At last the thing became nauseous and intolerable, and she wrote, quote, The prudent fears that the good have for me try me more than most things, and I find that it calls for Christian forbearance not to be a little put out by them. I am confident that we often see the Martha spirit of criticism enter in, even about spiritual things. O oh Lord, enable us to keep our ranks in righteousness. End quote. Tramp, 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 tramp. 7. And Enoch walked with God, and Noah walked with God, and Abraham walked with God, and Moses walked with God. Tramp, 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 tramp. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to make David king over all Israel. O Lord, enable us to keep our ranks in righteousness. End of Part 2, Chapter 7 of Mushrooms on the Moor Part 2, Chapter 8 of Mushrooms on the Moor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 2, Chapter 8. The First Mate. First officers are often worse than skippers, remarked the night watchman in Mr. W. W. Jacob's Light Freights. In the first place, they know they ain't skippers, and that alone is enough to put them in a bad temper, especially if they've had their certificate a good many years and can't get a vacancy. I fancy there is something in the night watchman's philosophy, and I am therefore writing a word or two for the special benefit of first mates. I am half inclined to address it to first mates only, for to second mates, third mates, and other inferior officers I have nothing to say. But the first mate evokes our sympathy on the ground that the night watchman states so forcibly. First mates know they ain't skippers, and that alone is enough to put them in a bad temper. It is horribly vexatious to be next door to greatness. An old proverb tells us that a miss is as good as a mile but like most proverbs, it is as false as false can be. A mile is ever so much better than a miss. I'm fond of cricket, and am president of a certain club. I invariably attend the matches, unless the house happens to be on fire. I have enough of the sporting instinct to be able to take defeat cheerfully, if the defeat falls within certain limits. It must not be so crushing as to be a positive humiliation, nor must it be by so fine a margin as to constitute itself a tantalization. Of the two, I prefer the former to the latter." The former can be dismissed under certain recognized forms. The glorious uncertainty of cricket, you say to yourself. It's all in the game, and the best side in the world sometimes has an off day. But if, after a great struggle, you lose by a run, you go home thinking uncharitable thoughts of the bowler who might have prevented the other fellow from making a certain boundary hit, of the wicket-keeper who might have saved a bye, or of the batsman who might easily have got a few more runs if he hadn't played such a ridiculously fluky stroke. To be beaten by a hundred runs is bad, but bearable. To be beaten by an innings and a hundred runs is humiliating and horrible. To be beaten by a single run is exasperating and intolerable. The same thing meets us at every turn. A few minutes ago I picked up The Life of Lord Randolph Churchill by his son. In the very first chapter there is a letter written by Dr. Creighton to the Duchess of Marlborough, commiserating her ladyship on the fact that Lord Randolph had been placed in the second class at the December examinations at Oxford. I must own, the bishop writes, quote, that I was sorry when I heard how narrowly Lord Randolph missed the first class. A few more questions answered, and a few more omissions on some of his papers, and he would have secured it. He was, I am told by the examiners, the best man who was put into the second class. And the great hardship is, as your grace observes, that he should be in the same class with so many who are greatly his inferior in knowledge and ability. It is rather tantalizing to think that he came so near— if he had been farther off, I should have been more content. End quote. Now that is exactly the misery of the first mate. He is so near to being a skipper, so very near. He even carries continually in his pocket the official papers that certify that he is fully qualified to be a skipper. And yet for all that, he is not a skipper. Sometimes, indeed, he fancies that he will never be a skipper. It is very trying. I'm sorry, genuinely sorry for the first mate. What can I say to help him? Perhaps the thing that he will most appreciate is a reminder of the tremendous debt that the world owes to its first mates. I was reading the other day Dasent's great Life of Delane. Among the most striking documents printed in these five volumes are the letters that Delane wrote from the seat of war during the struggle in the Crimea to the substitute who occupied his own editorial chair in the office of the Times. And the whole burden of those letters is to show that England was saved in those days by a first mate. The admiral, he says in one letter, quote, is by no means up to his position. The real commander is Lyons, who is just another Nelson, full of energy and activity, end quote. 
two days later he says again quote, nothing but the energy and determination of sir e leans overcame the difficulties and impossibilities raised by those who seem to have always a consistent objection to doing anything until their to-morrow shall arrive all the credit is due to him and to him alone for our admiral never left his ship which was anchored three miles from the shore and contented himself with sending the same contingent of men and boats as the other ships End quote. And writing again after the landing had been effected, Delane says, quote, Remember always that in the great credit which the success of this landing deserves, Dundas has no share. Lyons has done all. And this, in spite of discouragement such as a smaller man would have resented. Nelson could not have done better, and, indeed, his case at Copenhagen nearly resembles this. End quote. Here, then, is a feather in the cap of the first mate he may often save a vital situation which in the hands of a dilatory skipper might easily have been lost the skipper is skipper and knows it he is at the top of the tree and there remains nothing to struggle after he is apt to rest on his laurels and lose his energy this subtle tendency is the first mate's opportunity the ship must not be lost because the skipper goes to sleep everything at such an hour depends on the first mate nor is it only in time of war and crisis that the first mate comes to his own in the arts of peace the self-same principle holds good what could our literature have done without the first mate and in the republic of letters the first mate is usually a woman it is only quite lately that women have to any appreciable extent applied themselves to the tasks and responsibilities of authorship until well into the eighteenth century mrs grundy scowled out of countenance any intrepid female who threatened to invade the sacred domain in 1778, however, Mrs. Fanny Burney braved the old lady's wrath, published Evelina, and became the pioneer of a new epoch. One of these days, perhaps on the bicentenary of that event, the army of women who wield the pen will erect a statue to the memory of that courageous and brilliant pathfinder. When they do so, two memorable scenes in the life of their heroine will probably be represented in bas-relief upon the pedestal. The one will portray Mrs. Burney, hopeless of ever inducing a biased public to read a woman's work making a bonfire of the manuscripts to which she had devoted such patient care the other will illustrate the famous scene when mrs burney danced a jig to daddy crisp round the great mulberry tree at chessington it was her diary tells us the uncontrollable outcome of her exhilaration on learning of the praise which the great dr johnson bestowed upon evelina Quote, it gave me such a flight of spirits she says that i danced a jig to mr crisp without any preparation music or explanation to his no small amazement and diversion End quote. Macaulay declared that Miss Burney did for the English novel what Jeremy Collier did for the English drama, and she did it in a better way. Quote, she first showed that a tale might be written in which both the fashionable and the vulgar life of London might be exhibited with great force and with broad comic humor, and which should yet contain not a single line inconsistent with rigid morality or even with virgin delicacy. She took away the reproach which lay on a most useful and delightful species of composition. End quote prejudice however dies hard and the same writer tells us in another essay that seventy years later some reviewers were still of the opinion that a lady who dares to publish a book renounces by that act the franchises appertaining to her sex and can claim no exemption from the utmost rigor of critical procedure but however strong may have been the prejudice against a woman becoming captain and taking her place upon the bridge nobody could object to her becoming first mate and it is as first mate that woman has rendered the most valuable service a few, like Fanny Burney and Jane Austen and Charlotte Bronte and George Eliot, may have become skippers, but we could better afford to lose all the works of such writers than lose the influence which women have exerted over captains whom they served in the capacity of first mate. It was a saying of Emerson's that a man is entitled to credit not only for what he himself does, but for all that he inspires others to do. To no subject does this axiom apply with greater force than to this— it would be a fatal mistake to suppose that the contribution of women to the republic of letters begins and ends with the works that bear feminine names upon their title pages our literature is adorned by a few examples of acknowledged collaboration between a man and a woman and only in very rare instances is the woman the minor contributor but in addition to these there are innumerable records of men whose names stand in the foremost rank among our laureates and teachers yet whose work would have been simply impossible but for the woman in the background from a host of examples that naturally rush to mind we may instance almost at random the cases of wordsworth carlyle and robert louis stevenson in the days of his restless youth when wordsworth was in danger of entangling himself in the military and political tumults of the time it was his sister who recalled him to his desk and pointed him along the road that led to destiny 
it is miss mason remarks quote, in moments such as this that men especially those who feed on their feelings become desperate and think and do desperate acts it was at this critical moment for wordsworth that his sister dorothy stepped into his life and saved him End quote. she soothed his mind the same writer says again banished from it both contemporary politics and religious doubts and infused instead love of beauty and dependence on faith and so she reawoke craving for poetic expression she in the midst of all preserved him still a poet made him seek beneath that name and that alone his office upon earth poor dorothy she accompanied her brother on more than half his wanderings she pointed out to him more than half the loveliness that is embalmed in his verses she suggested to him half of his themes as the poet himself confessed she gave me eyes she gave me ears and humble cares and delicate fears a heart the fountain of sweet tears and love and thought and joy yes the world owes more than it will ever know to the first mates as loyal and true and helpful as dorothy wordsworth the skipper stands on the bridge and gets all the glory but only he and the first mate know how much was due to the figure in the background think too of that bright spring day nearly fifty years ago now when a lady driving through hyde park to see the beauty of the crocuses and the snowdrops was seen to lurch suddenly forward in her carriage and a moment after was found to be dead it was a loss unspeakable in its intensity for carlyle mr mclean watt says in his monograph quote, this woman was one of the bravest and brightest influences in his life though perhaps it was entirely true that he was not aware of his indebtedness until the veil of silence fell between End quote. the skipper is never aware of his indebtedness to the first mate that is an essential feature of the relationship it is the glory of the first mate that he works without thought of recognition or reward glad if he can keep the ship true to her course and ever proud to see the skipper crowned with all the glory carlyle's debt to his wife is one of the most tragic stories in the history of letters in the ruined nave of the old abbey kirk the sage tells us quote, with the skies looking down on her there sleeps my little genie and the light of her face will never shine on me more i say deliberately her part in the stern battle and except myself none knows how stern was brighter and braver than my own End quote and in stevenson's case the obligation was even more marked what a debt he owed to women one of his biographers exclaims quote, in his puny ailing infancy his mother and his nurse cummy had soothed and tended him in his troubled hour of youth he had found an inspirer consoler and guide in mrs stitwell to teach him belief in himself in his moment of failure and struggle with poverty and death itself he had married a wife capable of being his comrade his critic and his nurse End quote we owe all the best part of stevenson's work to the presence by his side of a wife who possessed as sir sidney colvin testifies quote, a character as strong interesting and romantic as his own she was the inseparable sharer of all his thoughts the staunch companion of all his adventures the most open-hearted of friends to all who loved him the most shrewd and stimulating critic of his work and in sickness despite her own precarious health the most devoted and most efficient of nurses End quote dorothy wordsworth jane carlyle and fanny stevenson are representatives of a great host of brave and brilliant women without whom our literature would have been poor indeed some day we shall open a pantheon in which we shall place splendid monuments to our first mates at present we fill our westminster abbeys with the statues of skippers but depend upon it injustice cannot last for ever some day the world will ask not only was this man great but also who made this man so great and when this old world of ours takes it into its head to ask such questions the day of the first mate will at last have dawned one other word ought to be said although it seems a cruel kindness to say it it is this there are people who succeed brilliantly as first mates but who fail ignominiously as skippers aaron is of course the classical example as long as moses was skipper and aaron first mate everything went well but moses withdrew for a while and then aaron took command Quote, and the lord said unto moses go thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of egypt have corrupted themselves they have turned aside quickly out of the way which i commanded them they have made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said these be thy gods o israel which have brought thee out of the land of egypt End quote. as long i say as moses was skipper and aaron first mate aaron did magnificently but when aaron took command he was as dr white says quote, a mere reed shaken with the wind as weak and as evil as any other man those forty days that moses spent up on the mount brought out among other things both moses's greatness and aaron's littleness and weakness in a way that nothing else could have done 
up make us gods which shall go before us for as this moses we know not what has become of him and aaron went down like a broken reed before the idolatrous clamour of the revolted people End quote. the day of judgment depend on it will be a day of tremendous surprises and not least among its astonishments will be the disclosure of the immense debt that the world owes to its first mates and the first mates who never become skippers will in that great day understand the reason why and when they know the reason why they will be among the most thankful of the thankful it will be so much better for me to be applauded at the last as a good and faithful first mate than to have to confess that